Okay? Um, so in the process of, so we, yesterday we went through all the procedures to the casting part. What we glossed over was how do we mount our maxillary cast onto our articulators, right? So hopefully some of you guys brought yours today and we'll go over a few exercises to visualize some of this stuff. So um, some of the questions we'll ask is how can we best simulate the movements of the jaw? How do we mount our cast onto the articulator? So just a quick review of our um, jaw, I guess. It moves, right? It rotates and it translates. So there's a rotation around the horizontal axis. So your first 25 degrees of opening is pure rotation, OK? Once you go beyond that, if you open real big, like almost when you yawn, what happens to the condyles? They start to translate. So that's the um, picture on the right. It also translates in other movements, like protrusive movements, right? Stick your teeth so they're edge to edge. You move your jaw forward. That's translating. You're moving down the articular eminence. If you move your jaw to one side, what happens? Well, one side's rotating. The other side is translating. Okay, so those are the movements that we see. Hopefully this is review. So here's the question, right? We want to put this maxillary cast in the same orientation, or you think about it this way, the same distance away from the hinge axis um, on the articulator as it is in the mouth. This way it best mimics what the patient does, right? So whatever distance that was, you want to mimic on your articulator. Again, this makes sense because what's the purpose of the articulator? It's an instrument that simulates the movement of your jaw. So how do you mimic, right, the first 25 degrees of opening is a pure rotation around the horizontal axis, so the line that bisects the condyles. How do we mimic that on the articulator? Well, you'll lift the top member up, okay? So it's a little bit opposite in the sense that it's our lower jaw that moves, but when you simulate it on the articulator, which member are you moving? The upper, okay? But essentially, it's the same movement, right? Another way you can do it is if you really want to mimic your jaw, hold the upper still, and then go like this. This is more like what your jaw does, right? The easier way is just have this on a table and open it. Okay, same motion. Got the idea? Okay, how do we translate this cast? What do you have to do to the articulator? How do we move that forward? Can we just push it forward? No, you gotta unlatch the hinge on the back. There's a little hinge at the top member. If you undo that, everybody find the hinge? So if you look between the two black knobs and you look down a little bit, or a lever, what do you guys call that? Hinge, I don't know, a latch, latch, very good. Undo the latch. What happens now when you push the top member forward. That simulates what? A protrusive movement, right? And if you hold on to the pin and you slide it to the left, slide it to the right, what motion does that simulate? Lateral movement of your jaw, right? So not rocket science, but just silly exercise to get to know your articulator. Okay, so when the latch is down, that simulates the pure rotational movement. But the articular can also mimic the translation movements in straight protrusive and lateral. Okay? So you see how this instrument starts to mimic what our jaw does? And this will be important. So the maxillary cast should be mounted in the same three dimensional orientation as the maxilla is related to the hinge axis. The hinge axis is a line that intersects between the TMJs. Or you can think of it as the line through the heads of the condyles. Or on your articulator, the line through the big two balls there. How do we mount the maxillary cast in the correct orientation? So with the use of this device called a face bow, OK? So this is that scary looking device that looks like a torture device that Bane wears, right? So that the use of the face bow, face bow is a caliper-like device that facilitates the mounting of the maxillary cast 
onto their articulator in relation to the patient's hinge axis in all three dimensions. So basically, think of it as a measuring device. And I'll show you a video of that and how to use it. Okay? But the idea is this helps us get that distance. What is the distance from the condyle to where the teeth are? So you see that? OK. And so not only in this uh, view, but also from the frontal view, you want to get that distance. OK? So for example, if your, let's say your maxillary jaw, for some reason you were born deformed, and you were five millimeters off the midline, okay, then when you mount it on the articulator, hopefully that cast is going to be five millimeters off the midline so that it reflects what you look like. So that's the face bow. Um, so the other thing it does, too, is it lets us know where our uh, horizon is. So we have this line called the Frankfurt Horizontal Plane. So we have two anatomical, so two points make a line, right? So the line between the external auditory meatus and the orbital is what designates our horizontal plane, or the Frankfurt Horizontal. So in anatomy, if a, somebody's standing more or less upright in a normal anatomical position, Right, so all the positions that they show in the head and neck anatomy photos, right, they're just standing like this. If you drew a line from their external auditory meatus to the orbital, that's going to be more or less parallel to the floor or the horizon. So it's a way to orient ourselves to what the horizon is. So just know that, Frankfurt horizontal. So because that's important because the top member of the articulator the, and when I say the top member, I mean this area right here. This is supposed to represent the Frankfurt horizontal, or that should be parallel to the floor. So we want to put our maxillary casts in a occlusal plane, or the angle of that should mimic what the patient has when we line up the Frankfurt horizontal. So if we look at our um, patient here, we can see the Frankfurt horizontal, and you see how the occlusal plane ramps up a bit as we go posteriorly. So we want that same look when we put it on the articulator. Clear? Okay, so let's add on to that principle. So the orbital, that sometimes is hard to palpate and feel. The external auditory meatus is real easy. It's kind of where your opening of your ears are, right? But the orbital, it's kind of right around here, and you don't really know where it is. So what they did is they picked another landmark called the nasion, and think of that as sort of the little depression right above your nose. So they did anatomical studies, and they took an average of a lot of human skulls, and they said the nasion is about 23 millimeters superior to that orbital. So instead of looking for the orbital, we can just look for the nasion. If we know the nasion, then we can back calculate and kind of know where the orbital is. Okay? So it's just a different reference point. All right, so 23 millimeters, the nasion is used as a what they call a third point of reference. So you hear that term. Okay? So it functions like a tripod, right? Just like a GPS. You need three locations to be able to triangulate something in three dimensions. So the three points that we're going to choose are the ears, the teeth, and then the nasion. So that helps us orient ourselves in three dimensions. So when you explain to the patient, you say this is a measuring device. It works like a tripod. We need three points to be able to, to triangulate things. This is a short three minutes. What we're going to do is get the bite registration for the bite fork. And the material we're going to use is the purple registil, because that gives us a little bit more working time than the take one, uh, which is find it necessary uh, since you got the mechanical retention of the uh, material. Um, so I'll do this. I'll go ahead and lean your head back for me. Um, we'll retract here, and what I'm looking for is there's a little line in the front here of the bite fork. I just want to line that up with the uh, midline of 8 and 9. 
And I'm just going to gently hold that in place until it sets for about a minute and a half. So I've inserted the bite fork into the appropriate slot here. And the way I like to explain this procedure to the patient, because um, it looks a little scary, is I'll describe it as a tripod. Um, so I'll tell them there's three points of reference. This part will go in your ears, this part will go over the bridge of your nose, and then when we took the bite fork, that's where we're going to index the teeth. So this part toggles back and forth, and I'll have the patient help me by holding on to the sides here and um, inserting those into the ears so that it's as comfortable to them as they can be. Okay, go ahead. And at the same time he's doing that, I'm going to have him open and I'm going to slide this bite fork in, not worrying right now about if it's indexed the teeth. So is that comfortable to you? So at this point I'll tighten down these screws here and go ahead and hold this side too, both sides. Okay, so this prevents it from going in and out and I'm going to slide this up and I'm going to orient this so it's over the bridge of the nose and I'm going to tighten this. So make sure everything's tight and then the last part now is I've got the bite fork and I want to find where the teeth index. And I'm going to do that by toggling this back and forth, moving this in and out, and whatever it takes to get an index. So now I got that index on the teeth. So at this point, I want to just gently tighten this. And when I do this, I want to get these at 90 degree angles as much as I can. It's not super critical, but I find it helpful when we mount. So I haven't really torqued it down in place, but I just want an initial tightening. At this point, I'll ask the patient, I'm going to borrow your thumb here and push up on the bite fork. Now I got two hands free, and then what I'll do is I'm going to use this hand to support, and then this I can really crank it down and really tighten it. And you want to put counter pressure here to stabilize it. And I'm going to do the same on this one here. Okay, so that's all secure. We'll unscrew this, unscrew this, pull this out, and go ahead and take it out of your ears. Okay, and that's our face bell. So that is how you make a face bow record on a patient. Then the question is, well, what do you do with that? And the answer is found in this video. So we're in the sim lab where all the craziness is happening. So this is how we mount our face bow record. I'll give you the abridged version here. Um, so this part will come off by unscrewing that knob. And all you're going to be left with is this guy here. So it has the bite registration with the bite fork and then this um, kind of apparatus that you're going to put this mounting pin on. This then attaches to your articulator with this mounting plate. Okay, so that snaps on there and there's a little support beam that we'll put on to just help hold the bite fork up so once you put some weight on it, it doesn't slump. Okay, so that goes, that's a little support beam. There's a little um, peg right there that'll slide into that slot right there. So that's how you know you've lined it up. And this is all calibrated to mount this um, according to the Frankfurt horizontal. So this top little tab there uh, will touch the top member of the articulator when you close the articulator down. So you can see I'm moving that support beam up so it's holding the weight of the stone in the mounting plaster that we're eventually going to put on there. Um, so this is me, I'm going to remove that little pin then you're going to see me close that top member of the articulator once we've got the mounting plaster on. So the actually cast, remember we index the teeth so that cast should fit on there, right? Now you're going to close it. You want to make sure there's enough space in between for your mounting plaster. So you see how that touches that tab? So this is a horizon. This is our occlusal plane. We got a little room for plaster. So the idea there is once we make our facebook record and this is mounted, this is mimicking what the patient has. Right, so if we were to ask the question, what is the purpose of a face bow measurement? The way you would answer that is, the purpose of a face bow is to orient the patient's 
maxillary cast relative to the hinge access. Once again, if we ask you in clinic, what's the purpose of the face bow? You would say, the purpose of the face bow is to mount the patient's maxillary cast in relation to the hinge axis. Right? So now we're going to see the ramifications of that. So what we would say is the maxillary cast is reflective of what the patient does. So all the movements that you make, the opening, the protrusion, the lateral, is going to be very similar to what the patient actually does. Let's jump into a different scenario. And so we'll take a pause on the face bell. We're going to show you a different setup that does not use a face bell. And this is something that you may have seen if you've been an assistant or been in dentistry. We call this a triple tray impression. Or sometimes it's referred to as, as a dual arch impression. This is used in many crown and bridge cases that are simple, straightforward. So it's called a triple tray for a reason, because it captures three things that we need. So on one side, so if you look at the top picture, that's an impression of the prepared arch. So you have a prep tooth, and then the adjacent teeth, or the neighboring teeth in that um, arch. On the other side, if you flip that impression over, you're going, so that's that middle picture, you're going to have an impression of the opposing arch. Remember what material we made our opposing arch in previously? Or in the clinic, you would make that analoginate, and it would be a whole separate impression. So if you did it the traditional way, when you walked out of clinic, you would have two impressions in your hands, one in PVS, the other in alginate. In this triple trace scenario, you're capturing both of those things together. The other thing that it captures is our bite registration, or another way to think about it is the jaw relation record. How are the upper and lower jaws related to each other? In other words, how is the patient biting together? So with the traditional method, how do we get that information? Well, since we have all the teeth available, a lot of times we can just hand articulate the two casts, and that would tell us how they bite together, right? Because there's one point or one orientation in which everything socks in together. We also said a bite reg would help verify that that is correct. Remember, we squirt the registration between the prep tooth and the opposing tooth. So in this situation, when you make this triple tray impression, you're having the patients bite down together. So you've done this. You've done this with your uh, pre-op impression for your provisional. The only difference is the tooth of interest is prepared, right, ground down, the way you did it was you had the whole tooth intact. Triple tray impression or dual arch impression captures three things. Prepped arch, opposing arch, jaw relation record. One more time. Prepped arch, opposing arch, jaw relation record. Okay. It's starting to sound like a good test question. Okay, so how do you know you've got a good, so one of the things you're looking for, and it doesn't come up clearly on this slide, but is it better on your screens? You want to see some perforations or show through in the impression. So what does the show through signify? It signifies that, so why does light shine through that certain points? It's because the material is so thin. Why is the material so thin? Because teeth are in contact, right? So the areas that teeth are actually touching should be an area where there's no impression material. If there's no impression material there, light should shine through. So if your patient has closed down correctly in the MIP, you would anticipate that there would be some areas of show through. Where would you not want to see show through? Where your prep is, because hopefully you've reduced that to some parameter, probably a millimeter and a half. You shouldn't be able to see light through a millimeter and a half thickness of PVS. Okay? What if you don't see show through anywhere? What does that tell you? They didn't bite down correctly so that when you have your mounting, guess what? 
the distance between the prep and the opposing tooth isn't going to be really accurate, right? So if they bit together, let's say you reduce the tooth ideally, and they bit together, you would see a millimeter and a half of space. While you're making this triple tray impression, if they didn't close together properly, how much distance is between your prep and the opposing tooth? It's greater than a millimeter and a half. So if you sent that to the lab and they made you a crown, how tall is that crown going to be? Greater than a millimeter and a half. When you seat that crown in the mouth, what's going to happen? You're probably going to be in some hyper occlusion. Okay? Some variation of that scenario will be on some exam sometime. Okay, so the, what's the advantage of the triple tray? So no opposing impression needed, no bite reg, and you use a little less PVS material. So remember we said PVS is extremely expensive relative to the alginate. So does a faceboat record affect the occlusal contacts in maximum intercuspation? So let's use these two setups. We have the traditional way that we had talked about, full arch impressions, faceboat mounting, and then we have this other scenario, we took a triple tray that didn't have a faceboat. And let's compare the two. So let's first talk about occlusal contacts and maximum intercuspation. So when your patient bites down, where are the contacts? Okay, so the distance between the point of rotation and the teeth is going to dictate your arc of movement. Right? It's going to hinge around that axis. So we can see that the articulator, the semi-adjustable one, versus the triple tray have differing lengths to them or a differing distance. So you would conclude that they would follow a different arc of movement. However, when you think about it, they both start at the same place. So you can think of it either as the starting point or the ending point, however you want to think about it. But when both of those things close together, the teeth are going to touch in the same spot. So the answer to that question, does a faceboat record affect the occlusal contacts in MIP? The answer is no, because when the teeth touch at that starting point, it's in the same exact spot. It's only when you move away from that starting point that the path that the teeth move in is different. So can you guys visualize that? So both start at the same spot. So cusp tip, let's say, is interdigitating in that central fossa. So they're both hitting in the same exact spot. But as you open the articulator, the full arch and then the triple tray, you'll find that they move in two different directions or two different paths. They have a different arc of movement. But the point is the starting point is the same, and the starting point is our MIP contact. Does the face of record affect the occlusal contact's MIP? OK, so we're still on this point. So what I made, uh, so the picture on the left is the triple tray. The picture on the right is the full arch. I made just a fake provisional that was flat, OK, just to illustrate this point. And if you were a maxillary lingual cusp and you close it down, you would hit in the center of the tooth where those red dots are. So the contact point in MIP is the re same regardless of whether a face bow is used. The red dot depicts where the mesial lingual cusp of the maxillary molar would touch the mandibular tooth. Okay? So the next question we want to ask is, well, if the face bow doesn't affect, or that face bow record doesn't affect the occlusion in MIP, well, does it affect it in lateral? And what do you think the answer to that is? Probably not. Probably not. Yes. Let's dive into that. Okay. So yes, that's going to be some sort of factor when we talk about that. Okay. So two different scenarios again, right? Face bow mounted on a full arch, triple tray, no face bow. So here we're going to mimic a right lateral trusive movement. So again, if you unlatch your hinge and then you moved. So how do you simulate a right lateral movement on your articulator? When you unlatch this and you hold on the pin, which way should you move that pin? Hold on, let me think about this. So you want to move the lower jaw to the right side, right? So you have to move the upper jaw to the 
Right. So if I'm fa if I'm holding in this way, which direction am I moving the pin in? To my right. Okay. So let's clarify. Is everybody watching me? If I'm holding the articulator like this, I'm going to hold on to the pin and I'm going to slide the pin to my right. That simulates the patient's jaw moving to the right side. All right. Hopefully everybody's got this idea how to simulate a patient's jaw moving to the right side. All right, so the pictures I have up here are an example of me moving the cast to simulate that right lateral trusive movement. What do you notice about the teeth as you slide the cast together? Well, the canines are going to rub against each other, and if they're in canine guidance, guess what's going to happen? The back teeth are going to separate, right? So if a patient, let's say your patient has canine guidance, and then you'll look in their mouth, and you go, all right, with your teeth together, slide them to the right. And you'll see them slide, and you'll see canines and canines are touching as you move away from MIP. And then you'll look a little bit more posteriorly, and what are you going to see between the teeth? Space or air, OK? So that's what this picture depicts. Can you guys see the canines? Oh, good, I have arrows. Okay. Right? So you see the canines touching as we go into that movement, and you see separation between the back teeth. So from this view, do you see a difference between how the teeth move together? It looks pretty similar, right? Because the canines are creating space between the two. This is um, the triple tray impression, and this is from a little different view. So looking at this picture, pretend, all right, pretend you're the patient's tongue, OK? So just close your eyes. Pretend you're the patient's tongue, and you're looking straight forward towards the opening of the mouth. When you look straight forward, what teeth do you see in front of you? Eight and nine, let's say, OK? And then you look to the right, what teeth do you see? 30 and then 3, let's say, OK? So when you turn and look to the right, that's what you're seeing. 30 is our wax-up tooth, right? So the one in front is 29. The one above the wax-up is 3. So that's where you're positioned when you're looking at this picture. Pretend you're the patient's tongue. Look to the right, OK? So this is a view in MIP. And then now, still with your eyes closed, OK? And you're looking to the right. And all of a sudden, and pretend you're patient's tongue. And then all of a sudden, the dentist told them to move your jaw to the right side. Think about that, what that looks like as you're viewing from that view. You guys visualize it? OK, it should look something like this. OK? So you see as the patient moves their jaw to the right side, that you're going to get some separation and that you know, the overlap of the teeth looks different now. So when they go into that right lateral trusive movement, and as we're looking from the lingual view, we'll notice that it looks like that cusp tip clears, or the wax up, clears the opposing tooth, which is good, right? Because what is our ideal occlusal scheme? Canine guidance. Canine guidance means as the canines are gliding against each other, that there's no posterior contact anywhere. So this is in harmony with that principle of canine guidance. Okay. So on the triple tray, we're excited because oh, when we move it, it looks acceptable. Okay, so when using a triple tray, it appears that there is sufficient clearance between the posterior teeth when moving the mandible to the right side. This appears to be in harmony with canine guidance. All right, let's go to the full arch um, view. And I couldn't get a lingual shot directly because obviously the teeth on the other side are in the way, so we got it at a different angle. But again, you are the patient's tongue, and you're looking a little bit towards the right. That's the view in MIP. And then as the patient moves their teeth or their jaw to the right side, right lateral, OK, before I go on, the two setups here, the wax up and the impressions, are of the same type on. OK, so it's the same exact scenario. Okay, so same teeth, same wax up. I just do the wax up off one, put it on the other. Okay, so everything's the same except one is a full arch facial mounted 
uh, cast and the other is a triple tray. So what do you notice now about that cusp? We see an interference. So that looks different than the triple tray. So why do we see a difference between these two scenarios even if everything else about it was the same? Okay, so it's a difference in the arc of movement or rotation. So the principal difference between these two scenarios is that they follow a different arc of movement. Therefore, the teeth will move across each other in a different pattern or a different path. Let's illustrate that. Okay, so just once again, the triple tray impression had clearance. The full arch impression had an interference, even though they were made off the same wax up and off the same type on. So why do we see a difference between these two scenarios? So let's say you are the cusp tip of the maxillary molar. So we're going to represent, pretend you're a red Sharpie, and you're starting an MIP. And then you're going to have the patient move to the right side. Okay? So as the patient moves to the right side, your cusp tip is still going to be in contact with that tooth. I made a flat provision just to show you. Okay? So you're going to make a mark there. You guys following? Let's rewind it. Pretend you are a maxillary lingual cuss. Pretend that maxillary lingual cuss turned into a red sharpie. And you close together. You're going to start in that MIP contact, right? And then you're going to slide those teeth to the right side. As you move it, that's going to mark. Okay, yeah. One person nodding. Can I just get one more? Two, three? Okay. We can move on. So if we replicate that for both scenarios, you can see the lines that, or the path that that would take, right? So from this picture, it looks the same, but let's do this. So this is more in line with, you know, having them lined up. So we can see that the path in which the teeth move is a little bit different. One moves a little bit more posteriorly. So why is it that they move in a different arc? Well, let's take a look at the arc of movement between the two. Notice that the face bow, that distance from the condyle to the tooth, is much larger and at a different angle than the triple tray impression. So therefore, you see the difference in the arc of movements? If you overlaid them, you would notice that they would move in a different path as you move away from the starting point. Okay. So thus, when you compare the two movements, it makes sense that they move in different paths. And in the scenario that we're talking about, we would have it appearing to look like it was clear in the triple tray. But when we put it in a situation that mimics the patient's mouth, we actually find an interference. So getting back to your kind of point is, well, one of the disadvantages of using a triple tray is it doesn't accurately predict or mimic the movement of the patient's jaw. Thus, when you check your wax up on a triple tray, you may think you're in the clear. But when you go to cement it in the mouth, you may find that you have an interference. Okay? So that's increased chair time for you because you've got to make more of an adjustment. Whereas if you did the whole case on that semi-adjustable articulator with a facebow mounting, well, those teeth move similarly to the patient's mouth, and maybe you avoid that situation. Because if you caught that wax up in interference on the full arch, what can you do to the contour of that tooth? You would reduce it so it's not in interference. right? So in that wax up stage, when you check in that fully full arch face on mounted articulator, and all of a sudden, oh, I have an interference there. You can stop and go, hey, let me reduce the height of that cusp tip so that there is not an interference, so that when it turns into a crown and I put it in the patient's mouth, I don't need to adjust that in the mouth. Let's take a break. The main point is when you use a face bow, so remember the face bow helps us orient our cast so it's relative to the hinge axis, is that it more closely simulates what the patient does, right? Um, whereas the triple tray, whatever movements you make, in a sense, you can think of it as I can't really trust that those movements will be the same 
when you view the teeth in the mouth. Okay, so to help illustrate that point of, because remember the distance from the condyle to the teeth. Remember in the picture. Let's jump back to it. Right. So this picture here, where you can see that the face bow mounted cast, the distance from the condyle to the teeth, is much larger than the distance that we see on the triple tray. So the example I have of that is, so everybody look at my hands, right? So the distance between the two points has an effect on the arc of movement that I move on, OK? So the idea is that, OK, if I take my hand and look at my uh, middle fingertip, as I rotate around my shoulder, I go in a certain path. Right? I can touch this point up here, OK, when I rotate around my shoulder. When I rotate around my elbow, it's a much shorter distance, just like on the picture on the left. So when I rotate around here, guess what? I'm never going to be able to reach that point because my arc of movement is different. So that's the whole principle when we're comparing a face bow to something that doesn't have a face bow. It's the idea that the face bow movement, anytime you're moving away from that MIP point, is going to follow a certain path that the patient is also probably moving in. Whereas the picture on the left, the one that didn't make that measurement, you've just arbitrarily picked a distance that you're moving in. So who knows if that path that you're moving on is going to be replicated by the patient. Okay? So the idea is that uh, we had a few, you know, that example of that wax up where you would find a discrepancy between the face bow mounted um, uh, wax up to one that's on the fully adjustable articulator. So will you get that interference every time? No, not necessarily. That was just an example to illustrate that point. Okay? So um, sometimes a different movement will cause an interference. Or maybe both movements on both articulators will cause no interferences. Right? The point is, is just that the movement of the teeth relative to each other on the non-face bow does not simulate what the patient does very accurately or at all. So that's the takeaway message. Okay, I think we've got about 25 slides left. OK, so let's dig into this a little bit more. So what information is lost when using a triple tray? So one, we know the arc of movement is different. Right, so we wanted that right lateral trusive movement, and we saw how that movement was different. If we do a left lateral trusive movement in this particular scenario, so remember this is just for this example that I set up. This is the um, picture of what it would look like when I move that triple tray or that those teeth to one to the left side, basically. So if I mimic a left lateral trusive movement, I'm going to have something that looks like this. So again, this is going to be this direction now. So the right was the opposite direction. Now we're moving to the left. So those are the paths that we take. So now let's look at it on the picture on the right. This is our um, face wheel mounted full arch uh, cast. What do you notice about this scenario when you move the patient's jaw to the left? Well, you would see that the canines disclude the teeth in the posterior. On the triple tray impression, well, there's no contralateral canine even there. You never captured it. So you can't even simulate this movement, right? Because it's just non existent. So that's the other point is that when you move, in this particular scenario, when you move to the left side, the triple tray impression is guiding off of a tooth that wouldn't be guiding in the mouth. Because let's look at the picture on the right. The picture on the right more simulates what the patient has in their mouth. And it replicates the movement that the patient would have. If the patient were to move their left, uh, the jaw to the left, you would see that the left canines would have some sort of disclusion and separate the posterior teeth. Right? So you're missing a whole other half of the teeth that that information is lost. You don't know how the teeth disclude in that motion because the teeth aren't there. Okay. 
So in what scenario can we use a triple tray? So there are certain scenarios, because so we've identified the disadvantage of it using a triple tray. We know it doesn't simulate the path that the patient moves in. We know there are some advantages of it in terms of time and cost. So in our particular clinic, when would we advocate for the use of a triple tray? Um, let's get into this. So in our um, protocol, there's a few requirements that we need to fulfill in order for us to be able to use it. A class one occlusion, so this is our molar relationship, right? We don't want to think crazy like edge to edge or class two. A tooth bound, meaning you want teeth on both sides of the prep, and then a single unit case. And then the fourth thing there is canine guidance. We're going to show why canine guidance is significant. So, in canine guidance, when the patient moves their jaw to one side, we know that there is space created in the posterior teeth. So we can pretend we wax up a crown or make a crown to a certain dimension. So since there is space between the posterior teeth, it kind of doesn't matter what path the teeth move in because they'll never, they'll never touch. And they won't touch because the canines separate the back teeth. Right? So the whole idea of the face bow is that, oh, we can mimic the movement or the path of the teeth more accurately. Right? So we avoid an interference. But if your canines separate your teeth already, who cares how they move against each other? Because the crown that you're building will never touch. Okay, so you won't have an interference. It all goes back to that principle of mutually protected occlusion. That's what we're trying to avoid, yeah. So, you're saying you're so even if the movements of the teeth against each other follow a different direction, if there's still vertical space, so think about this, so yeah, the teeth will move in a different direction in a horizontal plane, right? Remember we saw the angles, one was this way, the other was that way. But if vertically there's space between the two, then who cares because they never touch. And you avoid the lateral interference. So that's the principle. Okay? So that's why in canine guidance we're much safer to use a triple tray because we avoid, you're less likely to have an interference because the canines separate the back teeth. Okay? I know, a lot to soak in. Meditate on that point, I guess. We'll review it again if you guys need. Okay, so the key questions are, well, does the time and cost saving of a triple tray impression outweigh the time and cost saving of the delivery appointment? Right, because at first we asked, well, what the advantage of taking a triple tray is, one, you don't have to get the opposing alginate, so that takes saves about five minutes. You don't have to get a bite reg, that takes another two minutes. And then you don't have, and you don't, have to use as much PVS impression. So that saves you $15 per appointment, let's say. Right? So we'll say seven minutes of chair time plus $15 of impression material. You start doing the math, you have some savings there. Okay? So, because remember, in your practice, chair time is your most valuable thing. If your butt's not in the chair doing a procedure, you're not making any money. So it's a balance. So we can save some time and um, um, costs there. But on the flip side, when you go deliver the crown, you don't want to spend a bunch of time adjusting the crown either. Because again, that's chair time. So in a single unit situation, usually the time saved during the triple tray impression is well worth the savings because your adjustment time on the delivery is fairly minimal because you're just adjusting one crown. And especially if you got canine guidance, there's even less likely a chance of an interference. So you feel even better about that, right? Okay. So there's other situations in which, let's say you're doing a full mouth rehabilitation and you're doing 28 crowns, full arch, full arch, or even a quadrant. You're doing, let's say, all six in that quadrant. Well, Think about the extra time it takes to do a face bow 
plus an opposing allogeneic or opposing impression of bite reg. So maybe, I don't know, an extra 15 minutes, 10 minutes maybe. Okay? But think about the amount of time that you have to adjust to those crowns if you're off by even a little bit. Well, instead of just adjusting one crown, you guys adjust the whole damn arch. And how long is that going to take you? Probably greater than 15 minutes. Okay, so th those are the two ends of the extreme. In each clinical scenario, you're going to fall somewhere. And this, this is when you get into the clinic, we're going to work with you to help determine, okay, appropriate use for triple tray or not, advantages, disadvantages. Okay? So the other question you want to ask is, okay, well, will the chair side adjustment in the crown be so significant that it will make it unacceptable to aesthetics and function? Sometimes we, okay, we say we're going to grind a little bit, adjust it, it'll be fine. There's times where you end up hacking away like that whole cuss tip. And then you're like, well, this really isn't going to work anymore. Okay? Um, so those are situations, those are hard to predict, but sometimes you run into that scenario and then you say, shoot, maybe I should have face mounted it, put in an articulator, because I've destroyed the anatomy on that crown due to an adjustment. So this slide just goes over our triple tray impression protocol that we have down in the clinic. Uh, we've limited the indications that you can use a triple tray uh, to certain criteria so that we can um, ensure good results when we do use them. So if you look at our indications, uh, this is for class one occlusion and mutually protected occlusion. So remember we want canine guidance so we can minimize the chance for the lateral in interference. Um, you need to have teeth on both sides and you got to have an opposing tooth. Um, so listed down in the contraindications is uh, multiple fixed units, so no bridges, um, no survey crowns, and this isn't appropriate for implants. Um, and again, this is solely for class one occlusion in multiple, or sorry, mutually protected occlusion. So uh, this is here for your reference. You'll need this when you get down to the clinic uh, for your case selection and when you can use a triple tray and when that's appropriate. So let's just finish up with this idea of um, what information is lost when using a triple tray. Um, and again, when you use a triple tray, you're not face bone mounting this case, which means that the lateral movements that you see on that triple tray articulator doesn't mimic um, what the patient has in their mouth. So really the uh, big point of this is that you end up having a greater chance for a uh, lateral interference or uh, interference when the jaw is in some sort of motion. Um, so that's the downside of it. So the question of does a facebook record affect the occlusion in lateral? Uh, the answer to that would be yes. Whereas the um, same question in um, does it affect it in a MIP in the dot contacts? The answer would be no. So whenever you have the patient just bite up and down and make these uh, occlusal marks where the dots are, um, a facebook record has no bearing on that, whereas when you start to move it side to side, um, it does. So we're going to finish up with this idea of conjular inclination. So just think when you move your jaw, whether it's a straight protrus protrusive movement or even a lateral movement, um, one or both of the condyles is moving in a forward and downward movement. So the question is, well, how, what path does that condyle follow as it's going down and forward? Um, so what we can see is in your anatomy that it's going to follow this uh, slope of the articular eminence. So when you talk about the condylar inclination, what that's describing is the angle that you find uh, between the Frankfurt horizontal, so remember that's the line that mimics the horizon and then the slope of the articular eminence. So that angle there is what we call the condylar inclination and that's the slope or the angle in which that condyle is going to translate down um, as you go into some sort of dynamic movement. Um, what we see on our articulators is the ability to adjust and customize our articulator um, to mimic that slope. So remember, everybody 
is going to have a different articulator eminence, um, but our Whitmix semi-adjustable articulator, and this is one of the reasons we call it a semi-adjustable articulator, is because we can customize um, this articulator to best mimic uh, the patient's uh, movement. So if you were to, to um, loosen up the little knobs, the black knobs in your articulator, you would find that you can um, move um, that whole complex to uh, a certain angle that represents the patient's condylar inclination. Um, so what's the big deal about condylar inclination? Well, we know that the steeper the inclination um, that the patient has, um, that the greater the, the space that's created as a patient goes into some sort of movement. So this video here is going to demonstrate that idea. So as you toggle the steepness of that articulator, or the conjugal inclination, pay attention to the teeth, and you see how you get a difference in the amount of separation that you have. So long story short, the steeper the inclination, the more space that's created between the teeth when you look at the posterior teeth. So the follow-up question is, well, how do we find your patient's specific condylar inclination then? So we know that, you know, every patient varies in their, their steepness, and we know that that angle is going to affect how much clearance that they have in their posterior teeth. Um, so how can we find out exactly what the patient has so we can program that into the articulator to best reflect what they have? And we do that by doing this procedure called an, uh, making a protrusive record. So the sequence that you would do is you instruct the patient to protrude their mandible into an edge-to-edge -edge position. So you want that um, patient to be edge-to-edge -edge because when they do that in that straight protrusive movement, their condyles have gone down and forward and it's translated down that slope a bit. Okay? So once the patient's done that, you're going to uh, end up squirting some bite registration material uh, in the space created by their posterior teeth. So remember when you protrude forward, it separates back teeth and then there's some space there. Um, so we want to correlate the amount of space that they have to a certain angle um, of the articular eminence because we know those two things are related. Remember the steeper the articular eminence um, or the conjugal inclination, then the more space that's created in the posterior teeth. So once you have that protrusive record, what we can do is once we uh, have the cast mounted on the articulator, well, we can stick that protrusive record onto the cast. So when we do that, what we want to see is that you want the teeth to be fully engaged onto the record. And there's going to be a specific inclination or angle um, that you're going to set it to so that it maximally intercuspates uh, the teeth maximally intercuspates into that record. So this video here is going to demonstrate this idea. So we have the protrusive record on the teeth, and you can see I'm toggling the angle or the conjular inclination so that there's one specific number or angle um, that allows that the, the teeth to be fully seated onto the, pro, uh, the protrusive record that was made. So basically it's just an exercise of toggling that um, starting at both extremes and then you end up getting end up in a position in which you can find the most stable position at a specific angle. So once you have that specific angle captured then you just tighten the knob and then you lock in that articulator uh, with that setting. So what if you don't want to go through all this exercise of going through and getting a the patient's specific condylar inclination? Couldn't we just set this to some anatomical average um, so that we can kind of skip this step uh, of getting a protrusive record? Um, well, the answer to that is yes, we can choose some average value. But then the next question is, well, if you're going to set this average, would you rather err on the side of it being more steep or more shallow as to best uh, overcompensate to avoid a lateral interference? So the way we want to explain this answer is we can say that the conjular inclination can be set at a shallow angle in order to minimize the possibility of a lateral interference. 
So by setting the angle on the articulator shallower than the average angle measured clinically, the clearance between the teeth and the mouth will be greater than what's seen on the articulator. So another way to put this is we will say that most patients, their condylar inclination, or that slope, is set about around 40 to 45 degrees. Well, if we set our articulator to something more shallow than that, let's say 25 degrees, then we know that as we're checking for any interferences in any lateral or protrusive movements in our articulator as we're designing our crown, um, we're going to design a crown that's going to fit within the parameters of what that patient is going to do when we transfer that crown back into the patient's mouth. Um, so since that articulator is set more shallow, we know that the cusp height that we're going to make that crown is going to uh, ensure that it's going to have clearance in the mouth because it, when we put it in the mouth, the mouth has a steeper inclination, which means that more space is created, minimizing the chance for an interference.